My pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Jessica Traunstein, who is a professor of political science at the University of California, Merced. She received her BA in political science from the University of California, Berkeley, and her PhD in political science from the University of California, San Diego. Dr. Traunstein is the author of the 2008 book, Political Monopolies in American Cities, The Rise and Fall of Bosses and Reformers, which won the American Political Science Association, Association's prize for best book on urban politics. Her 2019 book, uh, which she'll present today, Segregation by Design, Politics and Inequality in American Cities, has been recognized with two APSA book awards so far from Politics and History section as well as the Race, Ethnicity, and Politics section. Uh, in her latest book, Dr. Traunstein explores more than 100 years worth of data from thousands of American cities to understand how local governments generate race and class segregation within and between cities, often at the expense of people of color and the poor in order to enhance the wealth and resources of affluent white property owners. Her many awards and dozens of publications are equally matched by her remarkable mentorship and inspiring teaching at Princeton University and UC Merced. And I met her when I was a graduate student at Princeton. She was my all-time favorite professor. So will you please join me in welcoming Jessica Traunstein. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to present my work to you today. Uh, as uh, Professor Rue mentioned, I'm a professor of political science um, at the University of California, Merced. Go Bobcats. We have a graduate program if you're interested in political science. Um, and my research focus is generally on local politics, representation, and inequality. Um, and I have recently completed this book, Segregation by Design. And there's a puzzle that motivated this book, this project. So we all know that the quality of benefits that people receive from government, we call those public goods, is highly variable. Some people have access to good schools, well-paved and plowed roads, sewers that rarely overflow, public parks with playgrounds and restrooms, adequately staffed police and fire forces, and clean water, while other people do not have access to those benefits. And this is the puzzle that I started with when I began writing this book. Why are some communities so well resourced and other cities not? The answer, it turns out, is segregation. Segregation refers to the concentration of poor people and people of color in residential locations that are apart from the wealthy or white residents. In this book, I find that it is segregation shaped by local political processes that permits unequal access to public goods and services to persist. Despite many demographic and economic transformations, the United States remains a profoundly segregated nation. So you can see up here, this is um, not the most common academic um, presentation. I, uh, to help explain the research and the processes that I just overviewed, I worked with an artist, Derek Ritter, to develop a comic version of the story. And the first portion of my talk today is going to walk you through the story that I tell in this comic. So meet. Tom and Jennifer, they're the couple up here um, in the, in the left-hand corner. Jennifer is pregnant with baby Katie, who will arrive later on in the comic. Tom and Jen are searching for a house. They want to buy a home. This is going to be their first house. And they're looking in the city of Camden, New Jersey. And they have a long list of priorities that they want from their new neighborhood. They want a good school for Katie. They want nice parks. They want an older home that's been renovated and has some charm. They want low crime. All of the things that we all want from the neighborhoods that we live in. You can see here, they're, they're introduced to their real estate agent, Linda who's going to uh, walk us through the processes here. So they tell Linda that they want all of these things in a home, and then they get frustrated again and again with the houses that they find in Camden. Linda shows them one house after the next, and they have complaints about each one. One, there's too much traffic. In another, the schools are really terrible. In another, there seems to be a lot of crime or homelessness. They get frustrated. And there's nothing wrong with the houses that they're looking at. They find problems instead with the neighborhoods. 
So Linda, being the good real estate agent that she is, suggests that they look outside of Camden to the city of Cherry Hill, which is neighboring um, in the uh, neighbor's Camden. So Tom wants to know. They're, they're, they're shopping for these houses. They're looking at all these different places. And Tom gets thoughtful. He wants to know why Cherry Hill is so different from Camden. Is it just racism, he asks? I mean, that seems like a reasonable explanation here. Or that some people just have more money than others, right? Why doesn't everybody just live in Cherry Hill? And Linda explains here at the bottom, the answer is politics. And my answer specifically is local politics. Linda explains it really isn't about individuals' choices at all, but the fact that local governments have institutionalized racism. And what that means is they have passed laws and policies that have built into the design of the cities themselves racist ideologies. Since the earliest days of the United States urban development, local governments have influenced property values and strategically allocated benefits to, uh, strategically allocated government benefits to the benefit of white property owners. Local politics is at its core the politics of land use dominated by white property owners who seek to enhance their wealth and control the allocation of services like public education. And I look at the many different strategies that local politicians have used in order to do this. They use land use regulation, zoning, redevelopment, and the strategic placement of benefits and negative externalities. And through these processes, local governments create segregation along race and class lines. And this is, of course, where the title of the book comes in. Linda argues this was segregation by design. It was no accident that some places end up with good benefits and other places end up poorly resourced. Linda goes on. White property owners have seen their land use designs and their control over local public goods threatened by demographic changes, political power, and higher level government policies. And when these threats appeared, and I'm going to explain more about them in just a minute, white property owners have expanded the scale of segregation by moving to different locations. That can be a little bit of a hard concept to understand. So I'm going to explain it in more detail now. I'm going to move away from the comma. This is a map that I have in the book. This is Camden, New Jersey in 1940. Now, if you have any experience with Camden, um, in your lifetimes, it's probably a very different image than what people had in their minds when they thought of Camden in 1940. Camden in 1940 was a dynamic economic powerhouse. It was a mover and a shaker. And you moved to Camden because you had economic opportunities. There were tons of businesses. There was great places to live. The housing stock was plentiful and at the time, and this might seem kind of crazy to imagine, they had garbage collection, which wasn't the case in a lot of cities. They had sewers, which still wasn't even the case in some cities. They had regular service provision. It was a great place to live. And places like Camden, and I use Camden here as an example for lots of cities throughout the United States. Places like Camden advertised their public services. They said, you should move to Camden and you should live in our city and take advantage of our great schools and our good sewers and our clean water. In 1940, though, so this, the process begins in the early part of the 1900s, late 1800s, but by 1940, Camden had already become quite segregated. And you can see here in this map that there are clusters of neighborhoods in the center of the map that are predominantly African American. And then there are neighborhoods outside of the center of the city that are predominantly white. And this is the image that we have in our minds of what a segregated place look, looks like. Right? We have some neighborhoods where mostly people of color live and then other neighborhoods that are mostly white. What happens over the course of the 20th century is that these patterns of segregation change their form. 
So here, in 1970, I am now showing you the larger metropolitan area. And over to the left is the same map of Camden. And to the right, you can see, is the city of Cherry Hill. So what happens between 1940 and 1970? The post-war suburban boom. Thousands and thousands of families are moving out of central cities like Camden, and they're moving out to places like Cherry Hill. Why are they moving out to places like Cherry Hill? They're moving out to places like Cherry Hill because they can buy single-family homes on modest, middle-class incomes, and they can have more space for their families and their kids. But guess what? Moving to Cherry Hill between 1940 and 1970 was only available to certain kinds of families. The kinds of families that were able to purchase houses in Cherry Hill were all white. And they were all white, not because of wealth inequalities, although those existed too, but because of policies that prevented families of color from getting mortgage loans and getting access to cities like Cherry Hill. There are a whole host of policy mechanisms that cities and the federal government use to ensure that places like Cherry Hill would only be inhabited by white, middle, and upper class residents. So now you can see, as of 1970, Cherry Hill is all white. And Camden is quite a bit blacker than it was in my last slide, but there are still remaining pockets of white neighborhoods in Camden. And you can see this down in the, in the bottom corner of Camden and in the top corner of Camden. There are still neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly white, even though Camden has become much more a city of people of color by 1970. Now, Take a look at what happened in 2011. This is a zoomed in picture. And you can see that the white neighborhoods in Camden have completely and totally disappeared. Cherry Hill has gotten a little bit more diverse. And that's true in most of the suburban communities throughout the United States. We have a diversification of our suburbs between 1970 and 2011. But I want you to notice that the pattern of segregation over this time period has shifted. If we go back to the 1940 picture, the segregation happens within a city. There are neighborhoods of color and neighborhoods that are predominantly white. In 2011, most of the segregation happens between cities. We have cities that are predominantly people of color and cities that are predominantly white. Why is this important, you're wondering? Well, it's important because political representation is geographically determined. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that now. As you saw in the last picture, suburban populations have diversified, particularly those suburbs that are closest to the cities. These, we call them inner ring suburbs. But I have here just some data showing you the difference between the kinds of people who live in central cities and the kinds of people who live in suburban areas. And this is all metropolitan areas in the United States as of 2011. So cities are 58% white compared to suburbs, which are 73% white on average. And take a look at the share of people in poverty in central cities. Nearly a quarter of the population of central cities live in poverty, whereas in suburbs, it's only about 12% of the population. Suburbs are overwhelmingly populated by people who own their homes, whereas in central cities, there are many, many more renters. The median household income in suburbs is vastly higher than it is in central cities. And there a great, much greater share of wealthy residents uh, live in suburbs than do in central cities. So what we conclude from this is that cities, central cities, look different demographically than suburbs. So what are the consequences of these patterns for politics? Well, political geography is comprised of nested units. You are represented, all of you, are represented by somebody on the city council. 
right? You are also represented by somebody in the House of Representatives. And you are also represented by a senator. And you are also represented by the president. Our political geographies are nested within each other. And where you live determines who your representative is, right? If you leave Utah, you will have a different set of representatives. If you live in a different neighborhood, you will have a different city council member, potentially, depending on how your city is set up. When residential segregation maps onto political geography, political divisions become fused with race and class divisions. You live in a place that is politically represented, and that place is also predominantly inhabited by people who look like you and have similar incomes to you. It means that our politics becomes divided along those same lines, that our residential geography is divided along. And this has two very important consequences. You don't know what this is, and I, I, ho I hope you don't know what this is. But yes, you're, you're saying it. The first consequence is that segregation generates inequality between race and class groups. Because in a world of scarce resources, the politically powerful deny public goods and political benefits to those who are politically weak. Segregation across city lines has meant that the benefits experienced by racial and ethnic minorities and low-income individuals are inferior to the benefits that are experienced by whites and the wealthy. And I want to just go back to thinking about how the map of segregation has changed over time. So some of you have, have realized this is a sewer overflowing. A sewer overflowing is an absolutely disgusting and horrifying thing that can happen in your community. And it happens more frequently when your sewer lines are too little. Okay? If your sewer lines are too little, what would be a good solution to that problem? Build a bigger sewer. Well, there are inequalities in the ability for some neighborhoods and some cities to build bigger, more functional sewers. If you live in a city that is very segregated like Camden was in 1940, and your neighborhood is having a lot of sewer overflows, you could potentially go to the city council and say, hey, my sewers are overflowing. I would like you to fix the sewers in my neighborhood. And the city council might potentially do something about that. But now, fast forward to our map in 2011, where we have Camden residents segregated from the residents of Cherry Hill, if the Camden residents experience lots of sewer overflows, they can raise their hands all they want. But Cherry Hill doesn't have to do anything about those sewer overflows. When we have segregation across city lines, rather than within a city across neighborhoods, it means that the people who live in the disadvantaged places have no political ability to change the public goods that they receive. We have seen over the course of United States history inequality along these dimensions increase at every decade. And the argument that I make in the book is that these inequalities have increased because our patterns of segregation have changed. And our patterns of segregation have changed because the people who benefit from segregation want it that way. I hope you don't experience sewer overflows. <laughs> Segregation also generates political polarization between communities. One of the very difficult aspects of studying segregation is trying to figure out exactly how to measure it. And I spend a lot of chapters of the book talking about the ways to measure segregation. One of the ways to think about segregation, about quantifying segregation, is to think about how would we measure how each neighborhood differs from other neighborhoods in the same general area. Some neighborhoods will be whiter than others. Some neighborhoods will have more people of color. Some neighborhoods will be wealthier than others. Some neighborhoods will have more renters. Generally, throughout the book, I expect 
that neighborhoods that are whiter than the metropolitan area as a whole will be more conservative than areas that are less white. And this graph provides a little bit of support for my argument. So I want to walk through what this picture is showing you. Along the x-axis is a measure of how white a, per a particular neighborhood was in 1970. And recall that map of Camden and Cherry Hill at this time. We have some neighborhoods that are predominantly filled with people of color and some neighborhoods that are overwhelmingly white. But it's important that we take into consideration that some metropolitan areas just have more people of color than others do, right? And so if, we're, if we want to measure the segregation of an area, we want to measure the capacity for integration, right? You can't have integration if everybody is all of the same race or all of the same class. We need to have a relative measure. And that's what this measure on the x-axis is showing you. How white is one particular neighborhood relative to the metropolitan area as a whole? A metropolitan area as a whole could be very diverse, and your neighborhood could also be very diverse, a little microcosm. Or it might be much whiter or much uh, blacker or more Latino than the metropolitan area as a whole. So what this measure is showing you is that places that are whiter than the metropolitan area as a whole are much less likely to provide democratic votes in the 2008 presidential election. And areas that are much more uh, predominantly people of color are much more likely to give their votes to the Democratic Party in 2008. In but I want you to notice, too, that this is relative whiteness as of 1970. This is a long time before the 2008 election. And that's one of the arguments that I make in the book, is that these neighborhood identities are sticky, even if they change over time. Even if a neighborhood becomes more integrated along race or class lines, the original structures that were put in place in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s have persisted. And these neighborhoods end up with particular characteristics. And what we see is that over time, over the next 30 years, these places remain more conservative than others. I'm going to go back to the comic for a minute. And I'm going to point out these, these, the bar graph in the middle of the picture here. But you can't really read the words. But I, but I will tell you that whiter neighborhoods are also also feature a number of additional um, distinctive qualities. They're more opposed to close racial contact within their family. They're less likely to view inequality as a result of discrimination. And they're more likely to oppose open housing laws. We are at a place now in our nation where we have become ever more polarized. And I argue in the book that one of the features underlying political polarization is this separation of our residential areas. The more we are closed off from each other, the less we are likely to cooperate, and the less we are likely to find common ground, and the less we are likely to attempt to reduce equality where we have the chance to do so. This all sounds very depressing. And I will tell you that the comic illustrator that I worked with on this book, on this, on this comic, we got to the last page of the comic that I showed you just a minute ago. And he said, I'm not going to produce this for you unless you have something positive at the end. And I said, but I, that's, that's not what I do. I'm a political scientist. I'm not a policy researcher. I can't, I can't, I can't do it. And he said, well, I'm not going to give you the comic unless you, have a, unless you have some little tiny bit of good news for me to put in the end of this comic. And he said, and I want you to deliver the good news. So here I am, delivering the good news <laughs> in the comic. The situation is difficult to change, but it is not immutable. It is, however, difficult to address. The first step toward policy solutions is to recognize, really and truly recognize in our hearts, that segregation is purposeful. If we continue to talk about negative social ills like inequality and segregation as being an accident of some other process, then we will never get to the heart of trying to address what the real problem is. The geography of our communities did not 
happen accidentally. And the people who create segregation, maintain segregation, and benefit from segregation are always, 100% of the time, those most opposed to undoing it. But undoing is possible, at least a little step at a time. I try in the last chapter of the book to develop some potential ways to make inroads against segregation. One thing I have found is that if we consolidate school districts, we have more integration of our public schools. What I mean by that is if we take our little tiny school districts that exist all over in our metropolitan areas and we merge them together so that we have larger school districts, we are better able to integrate the schools within those school districts. So one policy solution is to think about consolidation along school district lines as well as suburban and central city communities. Now, who do you imagine is very opposed to the consolidation of suburbs and central cities? The suburbs. So again, this is a, a it's a possible policy solution. It is not an easy policy solution. Another policy solution is that states can try to force cities to build housing at all ends of the income distribution. So one of the factors that continues to perpetuate segregation is the fact that we have some neighborhoods where people of limited incomes can find housing, and we have other neighborhoods where people of limited incomes do not have any chance of finding housing. It is completely legal for cities to decide that whole areas of the city are going to have what are called one acre minimum lot sizes. That's exactly what it sounds like. You cannot build a house in this neighborhood unless you have it built on an acre. Cities can pass laws that define the minimum square footage of the housing in a particular location, and they can and do all the time prevent multifamily housing from being built. Multifamily housing could be a duplex or a triplex or an apartment complex or a condo complex. And there are many neighborhoods throughout the United States that expressly prohibit the building of the, that kind of housing in their area. What that does is it makes that neighborhood only available, only accessible to people who have the wealth, the inherent wealth, to be able to buy or rent in that place. So one thing cities can do is to try to encourage, in various ways, cities to build multifamily housing and to encourage more efficient and dense land use. This is complicated to do. Minneapolis just passed a new law that allows more multifamily housing to be built throughout the entire city. This is wonderful news for social scientists because now we can look at how, uh, what changes in the, in the housing market in Minneapolis. Maybe nothing will change, but at least it gives us an opportunity to see how densifying our communities might help along this dimension. But we have to be vigilant. Sometimes, Densification can have extremely negative consequences for people who are already marginalized. And if you're thinking to yourself that this sounds like gentrification, sometimes it does. We have to be vigilant to ensure that communities do not force multifamily housing into marginal neighborhoods or into tight spaces. I did some work with a, a community, a very privileged community in Northern California um, where they, they had a wine drinking, so you can imagine where this uh, community might be located. Um, and this community had, up until 1990, been, this is not an exaggeration, 97.8% white. Their, the, the small town, I think, maybe had three Latino residents. And the town got sued under the uh, fair housing law at the federal level and in California for not providing sufficient housing for Latino residents who wanted to live in the city. So the city gets sued and they, they lost the lawsuit and they were forced to build housing that would be available to the Latino workers in the community. So they did this. But what they did 
was they built all of the multifamily housing in one little part of town right along the railroad tracks where nobody would ever see, none of the tourists would ever accidentally come into contact with the multifamily housing. What does that do? It generates segregation by design. And the rest of this little town has been very vocal about ensuring that they do not want any multifamily housing in the remainder of the city. And so on the one hand, the city has done what they've been asked to do. The city is now about 75% white, so 25% Latino. Over the course of 20 years is very, very fast demographic change. And yet, they have resegregated the community almost completely. So we have to be careful if we are using these policy mechanisms, like building multifamily housing, to make sure that the most privileged places do not allow themselves to remain the most privileged places. At the same time, middle class housing is often squeezed by affordable housing requirements on the one hand and the need for profit by developers on the other hand. So we have to make sure that when we are trying to pay attention to the densification of our communities, we're building housing for everyone, not just the people at the bottom of the income scale, not just the people at the top, but everyone in the middle as well. And this is not an easy policy solution. We could also imagine a, another kind of policy solution, which is to give lower income residents massive housing subsidies to allow them to move and make choices and allow everyone to live in places like Cherry Hill. Again, I'm not all that optimistic about this as a policy solution, but I have to present it as one possible option. I'm going to say we can also move away from addressing segregation in and of itself and try to think about what are the negative consequences of segregation and attempt to enact policy that addresses those negative outcomes. And throughout the book, I show that there are a variety of negative outcomes of segregation, and one of which I talked about is that places with more segregation and in more segregated metropolitan areas have less good public benefits. They have worse sewers and they have worse schools and all of these um, things that our local governments provide. We could, instead of trying to address the segregation, try to address the inequality in access to benefits. We could try to make sure that everybody has clean water. We could try to make sure that everybody has access to a good school and well-paved roads and nice parks. And the way to do that is to ensure that our states are attentive to the kinds of resources and benefits that our local communities are providing. Garnering state support for either desegregation or redistribution of public benefits will require tremendous political pressure from marginalized groups and their allies. And this is an admittedly daunting task. However, these groups may find support from businesses and residents who have been priced out of unaffordable markets. Advocacy groups, citizens' organizations, and concerned policymakers must make building a coalition for a just and more equitable society our future. America's future depends on the success of this coalition.